I was out on Route 51 in South Hills with my brothers on Christmas Eve, and a drunk driver hit me, mm. totaled my car, and I remember thinking, welcome to Pittsburgh. Mm. You know, that was my, like, okay, the fire just happened, you know, for my parents, mm. you know. Okay. Welcome to Pittsburgh. You did what exactly what God called you to do. Y- your car is totaled. Wow. You know, so, and, and it was not easy. In fact, I went into the production manager at the NBC affiliate and I told him, I said, I'm going to Pittsburgh to this Christian TV station. And he goes, you know, you're throwing away your career. Mm. And I said, well, I have to follow what I feel that I need to do. So it was kind of miserable. Broke up with my girlfriend. It was just, <laughs> it was just <laughs> over this whole Pittsburgh thing. Like, what the heck am I doing in Pittsburgh, you know? This place barely has bathrooms, you know? And and it's like I had all this great equipment and it got taken all away from me. Welcome to Along the Way. I'm John Matarazzo, your host and fellow traveler. Thank you for joining me along my way as I try to become more like Jesus every day. The goal of Along the Way is to identify the moments in life that Jesus really is walking with us and trying to get our attention. But just like the disciples along the way to Emmaus, we are missing those moments that our hearts are burning within us. I want us to be able to identify those moments, learn from others, and apply those lessons to our lives so that we don't miss the blessings that God has for us along the way in our life journey. This week marks my being in Orlando for one year. I am so grateful for the last year and all the wonderful things that God has brought into my life. As I look back at this last year, I'm actually sharing the last interview that I recorded before I resigned from my job at Cornerstone Network, packed up my things, and moved south. As I was preparing this interview with Paul Bixler for this episode, I was so blessed by hearing his experience of a story that has greatly impacted my life. His parents, Russ and Norma Bixler, founded Cornerstone Television Network, which began broadcasting the gospel April 15, 1979, and has continued to this day. In this episode, you're going to hear Paul's journey into the origins of Cornerstone Television Network. And even though it took years, how he found his purpose. I'll get to our conversation in just a moment, but I want to thank you for listening to Along the Way. All of my episodes and social links are available on my website, alongtheway.media. You can also join my email list to get updates right in your inbox. All the links from this episode will be in the show notes. And now here is my conversation with Paul Bixler. Well, Paul Bixler, it's great to have you on Along the Way. Thank you so much for being here. We've been co-workers for a number of years now, and um, it's a privilege to have you here. You have a special connection with the founders of Cornerstone Television Network, and I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to work while your mom was still alive here. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to take this opportunity uh, before I end up going to, um, before I, you know, it's hard. It's even hard to say it. Uh, before I um, move on, move on. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to say. The like cornerstone is such a, a close place in my heart. Yeah, it's a family. It, it really is. Yeah. It really is. I grew up in Pittsburgh watching Cornerstone Television, and it has been for the last eight or so, eight and a half, nine years. It's been an honor to be a coworker with you, Paul. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for for being here. Yeah. Well, it's hard to believe that I've been here over forty years. <laughs> <laughs> It's like uh, looking at my face as this old guy, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like the age of my son, you know. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> yeah, you, you've told me that a number of times. You, <clears throat> know, yeah. you kind of uh, I love the whole family aspect of how yeah. people treat each other here. And it's mm-hmm. uh, really honoring to the Lord. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I have always uh, people that from the previous generation to look up to and to learn from. And, uh, you know, you've been producing here for a long time. And at a very high level, you produce the well, Origins program. I've done a lot of things like I've uh, learned how to edit. I've learned how to direct. I've learned how to produce. Mm-hmm. I've learned how to do, you know, the r- script writing. I've done pretty much anything, everything you can do here um, through the years. Yeah. But um, like, I, like I said, 40 years, uh, pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Um but part of my story is really connected to why I'm here is, is yeah. my parents' story. Uh-huh. And a lot of people don't know my parents. Some, some are aware of them. Sure. But they're, they're pretty much 
the last person, the last people that you would expect would ever mm -hmm. put together a, a Christian TV station in the Pittsburgh area. And um, I think that's one of the reasons God chose them because they didn't know it couldn't be done. Yeah. So they did it, but but so many people want to give them, uh, you know, all the all the glory or whatever, you know, and they deserve some of that. But at the same time, there was a little. It was a rough road. Oh, yeah. I mean, and a lot of people, I don't think they realized that it was not, it wasn't an easy thing. And it wasn't something that, you know, God laid in their lap and it was just all, you know, happy days and sunshine along the way. It to did get, not just to get fall out of heaven somewhere. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and, and, you know, the foundations of this place are built on, on prayer. But uh, my mother <clears throat> in 1969 went down to... Uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, at the Christian TV station, and she was just sitting there, kind of enjoying the the, the time. She went with a friend, and um, she was just sitting in the lobby. And um, my mother had a certain sensitivity, and she said that the Lord told her that that He wanted a Christian TV station like this in Pittsburgh. Mm. And my mother was just kind of taken back, just sitting there in the lobby of the the TV station. And and she kind of was like in her in her in her mind, just like, well, God, how would we? Do? She said, well, you know, Russell, you, you know, mm -hmm. your husband, um, you and Russell be able to, you know, do this. And and she was just like, this is a TV state, and and we're talking in in the sixties. Here's the late sixties, nineteen sixty nine. And back then, um, it's hard for a millennial like you to understand, <laughs> but. You know, TV was considered this like holy grail kind of sure. thing. Like the media. I mean, we didn't have YouTube and podcasts or anything like that. So yeah, TV was, was a big deal. It was an overwhelming thought. And then my mother was was, well, how how could we do this? And she said, and and she said the Holy Spirit told her that you know you just start and the process will happen. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, but how will we pay for it? And she said. He's, the Holy Spirit said, the money's there, mm -hmm. and, and and I'll take care of it. Yeah. So and what, so, was, what yeah. was your parents' background leading up to that? Because well, they had they had no connection to TV. Well, you have to understand, my parents came from, they, they went through the Depression. Okay. And, and, it, and it's hard for us to understand what the Depression was like, but it was kind of like the whole nation kind of groaned. On it was just kind of a negativity, and the people that had money were were the select few, mm -hmm. and and the majority of the population, I'd say, you know, probably more than at least half, mm -hmm. probably closer to two thirds. Uh, of course, I wasn't around then, but uh, just studying and hear my parents talk about it, and some of the books that my dad's written. You know, you ju you just had this whole climate, and he called it the spirit of poverty, but you know. It's just, you know, you, you thought poor, you acted poor, and you were poor, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was a whole mentality. And, and for, the, for my parents to believe that God could put together a Christian TV station, and their background is, you know, poverty-stricken kind of. They, they had no money growing up. Their parents were both uh, a family. It came from very modest families. Neither of them had much money, mm -hmm. but they always, you know, they come, each came from a family of four, and they all, they never starved. They mm -hmm. never, you know, their parents. Uh, my my grandfather, my dad's father, was born in a log cabin on a dirt floor. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that's just two generations away from me. Wow. You know, so this is the background that my parents had. And for the, for my mother to to receive that, now of course, she had been filled with the Holy Spirit, and she knew that God does. I mean, here we're talking about the Creator of the of the world, right, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, He could do anything, you know. So my parents were at that point. But the the thing you have to understand, John, is um, my mother. This was something that the Lord did with my mother. So when she came home and mm -hmm. she described this to my dad, who was a minister of a, of a small church, Church of the Brethren here in Pittsburgh, she 
she was dumbfounded at my dad's response. Like, there's no way I'm going to do that. I mean, my plate's full. I, you know, I'm doing all that. You know, uh-huh. he was just trying to keep the church going, and he had an interfaith faith Christian ministers fellowship thing, and we were just beginning in the beginning of the Greater Pittsburgh Charismatic Conference. Okay. So, I mean, he was just overwhelmed with all the everything that we were going to have to put together there. And then my mother laid this on him, and she mm-hmm. tried. And she tried all these. Be real charming to him, and then real like hostile, like you better do what God told me to tell you to do. And and, and then she finally decided after two or three months, it's not gonna, this isn't gonna work. And she said, God, if you want, if you want this TV station, you tell Russell because uh-huh. he doesn't want to hear it from me. And I, you yeah. know, I've tried all the the womanly, wifely ways to, you know. <laughs> To do with it. And of course, I was just one of four kids, and I didn't really know much about this, but I, I, at some point, I learned a little bit about it. Um, But I don't know if I heard it from my mother so much. About the TV Uh, station? Yeah, about the TV station. But what happened then, um, I would say maybe it was like nine months later, um, a fellow, a local pastor called my dad. And he said, oh, Brother Bixler, I think you're supposed to build a Christian TV. And my dad said, no. His first name was John. No, John, I'm not. And he's like, well, I believe that God's going to you know, show you all these things. And my dad's like, no, I'm not. And he said, well, I just, I, I want to pray for you right now. And he starts to pray. And my dad was actually in the bedroom of the parsonage at the time. Okay. And he said, when this guy prayed... My dad fell over in the bed. Oh, wow. I mean, he just literally fell over. The power of God hit him so strong. Oh, my gosh. And and he's laying there. He's laying there on the bed, and he's like, John, I can't believe this. The, the Holy Spirit just knocked me out. I, I fell over. I'm, 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 you know, the power of God. The Holy Spirit's accepting this challenge, this thing you're talking about. Wow. And, and my and my dad, and, and, of course, John says, oh, I knew it. You know, it's God. You're supposed to do it. And. And so then, <laughs> I guess at some point, I don't know how it went, but my mother, he must have told my mother what happened. And she said, kind of with her hands on her hips, like, well, I told you what God told <laughs> you. know." But th- that's the thing. My mother had a certain sensitivity yeah. that my dad didn't have. And that's one of the reasons why they, God used them so much. Mm-hmm. My mother had a little more sensitivity in certain areas where my dad was more of bold, let's go do it, you know, yeah. kind of guy. But it wasn't all still, you know. So they had they met with, you know, went back down to the seven hundred club, CBN, and they. So that's Pat Robertson. Uh, yeah, Pat Robertson, yeah. and we they you know talked about some things, and I don't know. My mother was just kind of still mad at him, and kind of you know on on the hips, you know. And they had uh-huh. gone to a. She was just like hanging her hips, like, "Would well, you finally believe me?" and She's like, well, this, you know, Pat Robertson was the son of a senator, you know. I mean, he's been around money. He's been sure. around can-do people his whole life. That's what he was raised in. And I was from ra- Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I was raised in a poverty-stricken family. Yeah. I mean, it's just totally foreign to my dad, you know. He doesn't run with the same people that Pat Robertson did in a, in a way, you know what I mean, as far as uh, earth shakers mm-hmm. m- making things happen, you know. And so it was a little harder for my dad to believe, and my mother. But, but like I say, my parents didn't believe it couldn't be done, you know. So they just did it. But so they went to a conference, and my dad was just like, "Okay, I know, you know, you want a Christian TV station, Lord." He just said a, a, a prayer out loud when they were driving on the highway coming back from Georgia at a, at a retreat that uh, they had been on, conference of some sort, and. Um, I just, Lord, I just, I know you want us to do this, but can you just give us one more sign? Mm. And um, and instantly, like my mother just said, well, the Lord says Isaiah 49, 22. What's that say? And my dad was a Bible scholar. And yeah. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is like his favorite book of the Old Testament because of all the, the, the wonderful things that it describes Jesus coming. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's easy in hindsight to look at that. And my dad didn't know the scripture. Mm-hmm. And he had the Revised Standard Version, which is now the ESV. Okay. And he had it between. He goes, well, there's the Bible. Look it up. What's Isaiah 49, 22? And, it, and, and then my mother starts reading it. And it, it, beca- 
I get a little emotional about it, but it's I will raise my signal to the peoples. It's basically the way it starts. And my parents were just in awe of that scripture. I didn't know that was in the Bible. My dad was like, I didn't know that was in the Bible, but God used that rhema from Isaiah 49, 22 verses. It's the the first section of that verse. Mm -hmm. And it's only, I think it's only in that ESV Mm-hmm. Um, where the word signal is in there. Yeah, I think other translations it uses the word banner or right. something like that. But, but, yeah. the, but you have that word signal. Yeah. And but that, see, that's God, the Bible that those, was sitting between right. them and at that, that and, moment. And that's, yeah. the, that's the rhema that God used, you yeah. know. And really, they were just like in awe. They they didn't even say anything for like maybe 100 mi- miles. My dad said they were just wow. like, wow, God... <laughs> You want this, you know. You 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 really you really want this, and wow! I didn't know that was in the Bible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My dad was just so, you know they they were just all guns a blazing and come back to Pittsburgh. Uh, a friend of the family uh, set up a nonprofit. We started on, uh, you know, set everything up, and then immediately there were negative things from local pastors some you know didn't really feel that this was an important thing to do mm-hmm. and and so my parents didn't know what to do with it but they would share it from time to time in churches and you know different things and and little donations would come in and I think they said something to us kids at one point and and my dad had I remember he had a thing at the front door where he had letters or something and he would have checks um, and I, you know, I was probably what um, twelve years old at okay. the time, maybe yeah. you know, going on thirteen, and uh, it'd be a check for fifty dollars, thirty dollars, you know, nothing big. You mm-hmm. know, we're not talking thousands. I mean, of course, in the in the early seventies, like fifty dollars is worth quite a bit more than it is yeah. today. <laughs> maybe like two hundred. That'd be yeah. worth worth two hundred dollars okay. now. Maybe a little more, but uh, so anyway. Uh, so my dad would say, why, "Why don't you run that up to the to the bank for me?" And so then I would ride it up, and I was kind of um, I was a chatty k- kid, you know. And I would tell the tellers at the bank, uh, Pittsburgh. It was P- Pittsburgh National Bank, which was is now PNC. Okay. Um, that uh, and my dad had set up an account for them. And I tell I tell the tellers, you know, my dad's going to build a Christian TV station, and they would kind of all smile and think, "Oh, isn't he cute? He thinks his dad's going to build a Christian TV station." <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we're talking less than deposits of less than three, four hundred dollars here. Yeah, you know, and I probably went up there, I don't know, maybe fifteen times, and you know, within that year or whatever. So they recognized you and they said, oh, here's Paul again. He's well, t- saying that they're going to start a TV station. Well, I didn't say it every time. But, okay. But, you know, but I was young and I didn't really perceive that they were, they were kind of like, they never said, well, that's not going to happen. They never said anything like that. But So, uh, you yeah, know, well, I just believed it was going to happen. But um, as I got a little bit older and then things kind of fell apart, you know, um, mm. as I got into high school and uh, those kinds of things. I mean, it, it was uh, it was a rough road until uh, 1976 is when things broke. And by the time I was, that happened, I was in college. Okay. When so, you say that, when you say things broke, what does that mean? Well, 1976, there were at the charismatic conference, Loring Cunningham came in. Okay. And then the founder uh, of Youth of the Mission. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jim Baker, uh, my dad went to PTL, and they okay. they raised some money that we paid for the land wow. with. So things, I mean, so you, you have to think, you're incorporated, like maybe it was like late 70, 71, mm-hmm. and you, basically nothing happens for five years. Wow. And God, I will raise, high my, raise my signal to the people. What's going on, Lord? You yeah. know. So they knew that God spoke, but right. it was five years where there was like nothing happening, nothing right. major. Right, right. Yeah, and so uh, I may not have the timing of events happening, but yeah. at some point we f- they filed for a construction permit for for Channel Twenty Two. 
Okay. But, of course, it was delayed because there just wasn't, like I said, my dad was not this charismatic personality Mm -hmm. that would go around and could just, you know, get people to instantly. And I think think the people at CBN were kind of like, what's going on? You know, I mean, (laughs) like, hey, we told you about this in 1970. Like, what, what, Right. you know, what's going on? So I think they were getting a little frustrated because they wanted the 700 Club and, you know. So it's kind of like the vision had kind of died. Mm. And then things started to break loose in 76. And, and I really was not in town for that. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right. And you were, and, you were studying for TV broadcasting. Yeah. Right? And, you know, it was interesting. I had a friend that he his dad worked at, at the local NBC affiliate here. And I went over to visit there. And I remember one time my mother used to say there was a show called Paul Shannon had this show on Channel 4. And, I, I, and yeah. I, when I was in the Cub Scouts, I got to go there and I, I told my mother, if I could just get on Channel 4, you know, like I wanted to get on TV. Not that I wanted to be on TV, but I just thought it'd be really cool to be on his show. It was mm-hmm. kind of like a Paul Shannon was a kid's show, you know. Okay. So just like in a, where they would run like the Three Stooges or some cartoons like Woody the Woodpecker or uh-huh. something. Some <laughs> yeah. quality stuff right there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, I was real fascinated. I always, uh, I, my mother said, you were always really interesting. You always wanted to, like, you'd wake up, I think I'm going to do an invention today. Mm. So, and we loved playing around with walkie-talkies and mm-hmm. doing all, I mean, that kind of stuff. It's hard to understand today for millennials. But back then, the technology was so new. And I had a little crystal radio set and I used to D de- what they call you go around you DX you try to find all the radio stations okay, and, yeah. and you'd mark them on the piece of wood that had your it was like a little crystal radio set like okay, kind of yeah, like yeah. before transistors oh wow you know they, they were kind of like a combination a crystal radio set would work on the power of the signal to come in and you had to increase your sensitivity with an antenna so I, I climbed the church roof and I ran this like 100 foot wire to pick up AM radio stations, you know. And uh, so when the transistors and then power came in, so then it's basically amplified now, uh-huh. the, ra- right. the radios now. But back then it was a passive, it was kind of like a passive signal response. You oh, this know? is awesome, Paul, because so, I did something similar like that. Okay. Whenever I had a, a radio, like a, one of the older radios that I had growing up, and I thought, you know, our, our telephone line is all throughout the house. Yeah. And we're only using these two wires, but there's four in there. Let me see if I can turn the other two into <laughs> an antenna and right. make the whole house. Yeah. Uh, you know, I ended up screwing up something with the telephone line itself and we <laughs> had to get that fixed. But yeah. uh, I got good reception for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I remember I could get, um, I could probably get about six radio stations. But anyway, I was fascinated by television. Yeah. And then when I looked at, uh, I wanted to go to o- o Roberts University. My sister had gone there. Um, she was basically six years ahead of me. She was uh, quite a bit older than me. And uh, I had visited the school, and I thought it was really a nice place. And mm-hmm. really wanted to be around Christians. And uh, so... Um, so that's kind of where I made up my mind that in 10th grade that I wanted to go to ORU. So it was the only place I ever applied. I didn't uh-huh. even apply anywhere. And did they have a television program? They had a telecommunication department. Okay. And so so anyway, I applied, and then all my counselors at high school were saying, oh, you gotta, you got to come up with another plan, you know. I thought about other things, but I always thought television was fascinating. And I really didn't plan on working for my dad. Mm-hmm. I mean, that really wasn't. Yeah, because you went other places. I mean, I mean, it just really wasn't. It's kind of, it's kind of like you kind of want to. My parents raised us all to be independent, and my basically my sister left and never came back. Uh-huh. I mean, I mean, she did for visits, but yeah, she's like a missionary in Russia, right? Or no, no, different. No, that's uh, George Steiner. That's my that's my brother in law. Okay, but she doesn't. She's not in Russia. Oh, okay, okay. But she, she was a school teacher. But like I say, they, she left and never came back, and I had the same idea. I'm, I'm leaving, and I'm, you know, I love my parents, but mm-hmm. I just wanted to have my own life, you know. Right, right. And so, so eventually, then I did get accepted to ORU. I remember I would walk home from school, 
At that time, we lived in South Hills. We would walk home from school. A friend sometimes would get a ride with, and sometimes I would walk. And I'd be coming home. Uh, I never rode the school bus when I was younger, so they wanted you to ride the school bus. And I just felt more comfortable walking home because it wasn't that far from the high school. It was a little over a mile. Mm -hmm. So I was. I remember. I somehow God shows me pictures sometimes of the future, and I don't know how to. I don't know if it's just my my wild imagination or it's just the way it's worked with my life a lot mm -hmm. of times. Um, and I saw this envelope from from o or Roberts University in my mind because I would get the mail. Mm -hmm. Mail would come like you know two o'clock, one o'clock on a day. I'd get home from school like two forty five, three o'clock or whatever, and I just had this mental picture of me getting the mail and opening it up. So that happened for several days. You had this vision. I, I well, you know, some people say visions. I, I just had a mental picture. Okay, me coming home, picking up the mail, or Roberts University. Mm -hmm. You know, so this happened for eh, period went on for maybe like a week. I just it just was there, and um, maybe like the fourth or fifth day, I came home from school, saw a letter from Or Roberts University, opened it up. Read the first sentence and I knew it was mm -hmm. it was great. We are delighted. That's a good and way to start I, a letter. And yeah. I and 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 of course then I read the whole thing and I came in busting in the house and I think I think maybe my mother was there. I said, "You yeah, I can believe it's like I accepted it. Who are you?" And and, uh, and she and she said, "Well, my mother said, oh, I knew you know.' But I think in in, in hindsight she was probably thinking." I'm going to lose another one. Oh. You know, <laughs> she had three boys at home at that time. And uh, so, so anyway, I went off to college and I really enjoyed Tulsa. And it was interesting because, you know, my parents, I mean, they were, they were both first born mm. and their family and they were tough people and they, and they were strong, strong personalities. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just, I just wanted to go away from home. Mm hmm and I remember these kids. I was at, at, in college, and these kids were like crying because they missed their like families, and the, and I'm like, yeah, I kind of miss my parents a little bit, but I I loved it. I mean, I yeah. loved the whole idea and everything about it, and I loved Tulsa, a nice little city, total opposite of Pittsburgh. It's basically a grid. Uh huh. And you, flat. You learn all. Well, there's some hills, there's some, but not like not here. like what we have here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you know the city's laid out. You you just memorize the. I still kind of remember them to this day uh, from like west to east. And then you basically you go to like 51st, 61st, 71st, 81st, 91st. You know, you, you, it's like a yeah. grid, you know. Once you learn the street names, the main ones, you know, like every mile, mm -hmm. it's just a square mile. And so anyway, I loved it. And um, I did a little bit of uh, volunteering, but my parents basically. I think I got maybe like three hundred dollars mm. and a plane ticket. Oh wow! That was on TWA. Okay. A flight from Pittsburgh to Tulsa one way. Wow. <laughs> Whatever that cost, uh -huh. um, went through St. Louis, and I just was like, man, I'm I'm ready to move on with the rest of my life. This is like great. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had like three jobs. Like I was I was, I think I was vacuuming. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I worked um, to get through school. Yeah, yeah, and I I'm trying to think. I worked I'm trying to remember. We did did some kind of volunteer. I did some kind of volunteer semi pay mm -hmm. for um, different I mean, odd odd jobs, sure, sure. you know. And so it was like, so I it was up to me to pay for this, yeah. you know. So the first year, I I remember I made it through without having to, uh, and I got a minister's son's discount. You okay. Know? And, uh, but I remember the first year I was able with my savings account, which, you know, wasn't that much, but I didn't go into any debt and I was working all these odd jobs, mm -hmm. but I, i just felt like I didn't really want to come home. Mm -hmm. So that summer, uh, my sister was living in Tulsa and, I, and she would invite me over, you know, and, um, so I, I asked her, I said, do you, uh, my brother-in-law is really a nice guy. And he'd say, well, if you want to live with us this summer, you know, it's fine. 
And uh, my brother-in-law had a paper out, like these boxes that you buy paper papers okay. at. Yeah. And I did the route for him too. That was part of what he had. A, he had morning and afternoon. Uh, Tulsa World, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Tulsa Tribune. I did that, and then I told. I just. I, I just set out to try to find a job, and uh, I ended up working in a factory. And, I, and Tulsa can be really hot in the summer. And I think it was, we had a period of maybe like 40 days in a row where it was 100 degrees or hotter. Hmm. Okay, Tulsa. That's a long it, time. Yeah. And um, the factory was always about 20 degrees warmer. Hmm. And it was one of these um, factories that builds these electronic um, switch switchboards for like oil derricks all over the world. And these huge, massive arrays, and and I worked in the paint department and uh, for a company called Nelson Electric. And, and so you you did these kind of things to get through school, and right? Well, so 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 then my that summer, I did that, and you know, it's, at one point, uh, my brother-in-law found a car that had been in, it was a it was a VW, and it hit little Volkswagen Bug. And it had been in a wreck. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a 1968 or 69 Volkswagen Bug. And he said, well, he said, why don't you, I know this guy, he, he could fix the car up, paint it for you. You tell him what color you want. And uh, I remember it was something like $700. Okay. By the time we, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think my brother-in-law actually paid for the car. I don't even think he asked me. Mm -hmm. He's, he knew I didn't have any money. So, um, but I paid like seven hundred dollars for the car to get all fixed up, you okay. know. And so I had this car, and I worked at this factory. And I'm thinking, there's just no way that I want to do this the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I feel, I mean, there's machinists there, and I was like, I said, I came to Tulsa to do television. Mm -hmm. This is, I, I do not want to do this. So, but they wanted me to stay on, so I stayed on through the next school year, my sophomore year. But again, it was just the monotony of working in a machinist shop and this this factory with the paint department. I liked the paycheck, and of course, I was <laughs> working side jobs for my brother-in-law and some other people that had paper outs. I knew that I was not supposed to. I didn't want to do this the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. I, these it was so depressing. <laughs> Uh, to think that these people, that's this is their career, mm. you know. Um, it it maybe maybe for somebody like that, uh, they enjoy it or whatever. But I just knew I was destined uh, to do TV. Yeah. So my sophomore year, then I uh, I worked a, a little bit on campus when we were expanding some some grad housing. I remember I was helping put together furniture and just do all kinds of odd jobs. Mm -hmm. And I heard of these guys, uh, I think maybe from my professor in college, a TV professor, he said that they were doing this show called The Bible Bowl. Okay. And uh, ja I think his name was Jack something. I can't remember his last name. Anyway, he said, uh, he said I think you'd be great to help them out. So... I went over. They they had bought time on the local NBC affiliate. Okay. Um, and and I, I volunteered my time to go over there, and then uh, they said, "Oh well, we 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 want to pay you, you know." But I wasn't getting paid through the TV station, mm -hmm. so I went through and did all the lighting for uh, for all the uh, the TV and 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 the fellow that wrote the script, and I ran camera. These were. Uh, TK forty sevens, which which is funny because we ended up having TK forty fours in our studio years later here in <laughs> Pittsburgh. So anyway, I'm running this camera, and they got to know me at the mm -hmm. local TV station, and I let them know. I filled out an application, mm -hmm. and nothing ever came of it that I know of. Um, but I let them know uh, that I was really interested in working at at the TV station. So. Um, off and on, that I worked at different different jobs, and and uh, actually went came back to Pittsburgh and then my sophomore year, but they knew they knew who I was, and I I even came up just to show up at the newscast. Is there anything I can do? Volunteer? Do anything? So they knew my name, and I came back to Pittsburgh, got all the all these. I was really kind of depressed. I came home and 
I got a job as a security uh, guard, and uh, um, hmm. I can't remember all the different jobs. I was doing car washes. I was, I was uh, helping uh, this local Christian guy in South Hills who would park cars like a valet. Okay. I was working for so him. you doing whatever you could. Yeah, I was doing whatever I could. And then I just, I told my dad, I said, I really want to go back to Tulsa. And so I quit all those jobs. Mm-hmm. We went. We went back. My brothers ended up come come with me because uh, my parents were on a trip and they were going to come to Tulsa to visit my sister. So, so I came back to Tulsa, and um, the start of my junior year, I got uh, I got my class schedules and all things set up. I got my new roommate. I was in a different mm-hmm. dorm that that year, and it was I would th- I think it was within a couple weeks. I got a call from. Uh, this uh, director, he was a TV director at the TV studio, the local TV station. Okay. Uh, it was KTW at the time, KJRH, and um, was what they the call letters got changed to. And he said he was very German. He's from Germany. He said, Paul, do you still want you still want a job? This is you know. And I remember him saying, roll tape, you know, because I mean back then everything was videotape. Yeah. And so he called me, and I, and I was like, I had a class in like an hour, and he said, can you be here like in 10 minutes? And fortunately, it was only like 10 minutes from uh-huh. from, from my from the college to get to this TV station. So I I, lit, I actually missed my class, and I went to and do and ran camera for the noon news. The news, okay. okay. The noon news at at, at uh, Channel Two. And I was only the second, from what I found out, I was only the second ORU um, person that worked at Oral Roberts University that went to school at Oral mm-hmm. that worked at, at this TV station. So you so, volunteered yourself into a job. Well, well, yeah. So they knew, but see, they knew me. Yeah. They knew me. And uh, so then I was just like, oh, this is this is great. I'm, I'm working here. And I, I got in a good time because um, they changed the call letters to... KJRH, and that stands for Jack R. Howard, which is a big newspaper company that owns it, and it still has those same call letters <laughs> to this day. So um, anyway, I was there. I worked there for two years, and I you know, still went to college, and um, a lot of the kids kind of went and worked for Oral Roberts Television Production, but I was one of the few that made it into like the secular sure. area. And they used to pay me, I don't know what I was making. It was like three something dollars an hour. And they used to pay me and I got to really good be good friends with the new anchor. Mm-hmm. And he always wanted me to be there for the evening news. Hmm. We had the news at uh, I think it was at five thirty and at ten. Okay. And and so I mean I was telling them, I, I got classes, I got school. And and you know, but a lot of people don't understand the way a, a news TV station works. It's kind of like whatever the news department wants, they get. Yeah. And I was in the production department, not in the news department. Okay. So, so this this director of the news department said, "I want you every newscast that this guy's on." And what role were you doing? I was the floor manager. I was in charge of the crew at that. Okay. Time. Wow. So. I'm like, okay, all right. So, because because I would fix the lighting and, and make the anchors happy, you know, because mm-hmm. they're very, they're into themselves. I yeah. mean, it's a real the lighting is a big deal. But but I yeah. mean, they're but they're really into themselves. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, they just, it's all about them. It's it's in the secular world. But anyway, I got paid. I don't know what I was working. They would I would get credit for like seventy hours a, a week sometimes. Wow! Because we had uh, it was Tornado Alley down there too. Okay. And uh, we did this. We were the first station in Tulsa to stay on night on air all night with the with the anchor, the weather anchor, <laughs> and we would do live cut ins and run these movies. Okay. Okay. During the night, and they would pay me to. Co- so John, I. I'll tell you this: my grade suffered. Uh, okay, yeah. Because I mean, I was having finals and I was working all these hours, you know. So I mean, my overtime. I mean, they didn't they didn't care at all. It was like my overtime was like five twenty five an hour or mm-hmm. something. So I racked up all these hours, but I was able to help pay for school. I did go into a little bit of debt, 
And I know a lot of these millennials today would laugh when you say, yeah, you're, you went into like $5,000 debt. Wow. That's really, that's really, <laughs> that's really terrible, Paul. But, you know, back then 5,000 was worth a little bit more, but so, yeah, I was working at this TV station. It was an up and coming. And I remember we had this, the latest and greatest equipment and I got to do all kinds of different things. I got to know the sports reporter and, uh, I, I would help him with things, and so I really learned the whole thing about television. Yeah. So you're making it in this in the secular world while still going to school, right? And right. How did you end up back here in Pittsburgh? Well, though? see, that's that's you know, one time I came home, I don't remember. I think it was in maybe '78. I came home and we saw I saw the little building that they were going to do the, this TV at, and I was just like. <laughs> You know, I just I've been working at a TV station that has two pretty good sized studios uh-huh. and like the latest and greatest equipment. And I'm thinking. They're going to do TV in this, you know, I mean, it wasn't on the air at that time. And I was just I was just I couldn't I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just hard for and I thought, I thought, boy, I tell you, my parents have the faith, you know, and I. I just, at that point, I was too smart to believe that God could do it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I've seen what television takes and the money it takes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for us, for them to get on television and do a good job of production with this tiny little building, I mean, we're talking, it was like a 40 by 20 building, John. 40 by 20. That's not To big. house everything, like your transmitter, yeah. your studio, your master control, your production I mean, you know, your editing, I mean, it was just overwhelming to me. But we eventually, they did get on the air. I was in Tulsa at the time, and I called, they called and talked to my sister and I. And, mm-hmm. and I remember saying to my dad to my something like, well, I know my, I know you were having a hard time believing that, Dad, but isn't that something that, you know, and, and I was probably, I probably shouldn't have said that. But, but you know, it was just hard because I, I was in the family and I yeah. saw the, the doubt and the, you know, we went through a fire in 1978. I mean. The, so the, the station launched in 79. Right. But there was all the stuff leading up to it. There was a fire right. yeah, before that. Yeah, there was a fire. Wow. So, I mean, it was just an amazing miracle uh, that we were actually on the air. And, but I was, you know. So I, I continued. I didn't graduate my after four years because I was taking so much. I was my load was lightened because I I, fe- I felt like hey I'm working in television. Mm-hmm. I'm learning how things are done. I'm not working at that factory anymore. Yeah. And and you went there to work in television. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm so thinking you're, you're I kind of felt like I had I had things going. Not that everything was super fantastic at the station, but Mm -hmm. it was kind of like, you know, I was just a up and comer, you know, and everybody liked working with me and, um, I, I really had favor there. Mm -hmm. So I didn't finish after four years. And then I, I, uh, I came, I think it was, I think it was in the summer we had a, they had a telethon. So I flew to Pittsburgh and uh, to help them. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh my, it was it was uh, it was crazy. We didn't really even have bathrooms at that time. We had like a porta john. The women had a bathroom and the men had a porta john. I mean, okay. it was it was like a mission, John, <laughs> a mission operation. You come up on the hill, uh-huh. and there's not, I mean, there's just a bunch of trailers in this tiny little. My dad used to call it a cracker box, like a forty, <laughs> a 40 by twenty building, yeah. with a you know eight hundred fifty foot tower. And a transmitter, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, so anyway, I came. I came back. I volunteered for a week during the telethon, and I came back. And and of course, then the semester started it in college again. And uh, I started college uh, in the fall of 1979. But what was so weird? It's like the joy of me working at that at the NBC affiliate mm-hmm. was kind of taken away from me. Mm. And and it was like. I can't believe this, but I feel like I'm supposed to go to Pittsburgh. Hmm. And I felt like I was an up and comer at this TV station. So I don't know. I wrestled with this over a period of time and it was really hard for me. And I think it was maybe something like, I want to say like maybe November or something of 79, maybe even October. And I called my parents. I said, 
I can't believe I'm ta- I'm saying this, but have you been praying that I'd come to Pittsburgh? And they said, well, we're we're praying for the, God to bring the right people here. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I don't know, but I think I'm supposed to come. Wow. And I said, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how I'm going to graduate because my dad was always, you know, you finish what you started. You sure. know, that's what he drilled into us. So I went to uh, my professor, the head of our department. I told him my situation. I told him the whole story. And he was like, oh, well, he, he said, well, you got to follow. You got to follow what the Lord's telling you to do. And I said, well, what am I going to, how am I going to graduate? And he goes, well, we'll do an independent study. So you can do that and mm-hmm. get six credit hours and you can come back and graduate next next spring. Okay. So then I finished that semester, packed my stuff up, and my brother-in-law uh, and I drove to drove to Pittsburgh. Hmm. And then I I was out on Route 51 in South Hills with my brothers on Christmas Eve, and a truck driver hit me, mm. totaled my car, and I remember thinking, "Welcome to Pittsburgh." Mm. You know, that was my. Like, okay, the fire just happened, you know, for my parents, mm. you know. Okay. Welcome to Pittsburgh. You did what exactly what God called you to do. Y- your car's totaled. Wow. You know. So, and, and it was not easy. It was not easy because I felt like I left all my friends. I broke up with my girlfriend because I told her. In fact, I went into the production manager at the NBC affiliate and I told him, I said, I'm going to Pittsburgh to this Christian TV station. And he goes, you, you know, you're throwing away your career. Mm. I said, well, I have to follow what I feel that I need to do. So, I mean, I had all that against me. And then this, this, this car, my car is totaled. Yeah. Guy, drunk driver hit like five cars, ended up hitting me. I was the last car. And, you know, so it was kind of miserable. Broke up with my girlfriend. It was just, (laughs) it was just (laughs) over this whole Pittsburgh thing. Like, what the heck am I doing in Pittsburgh? You know, this place barely has bathrooms, you know, and, and it's like I had all this great equipment and it got taken all away from me. Mm. Anyway, I was faithful. Um, I used to spend all night editing. Back then we had videotape machines that you had to sync the tape machines and that's mm. how that's how they worked. You didn't have all this digital stuff that, yeah. that we have today, but... Uh, I remember spending many nights at the station just working all night and I'm thinking, Lord, are are you are you gonna be you know, what are you gonna do with my life? You know? Mm-hmm. You have me here, why am I here? You know, and I remember going through periods of time where, you know, and of course, you know, I got the little bit of from some of the crew, like, oh yeah, here's the boss's kid, you know, and, and I hated that too. So that made me even work even even harder mm-hmm. to prove to show people that I proved I want I deserve to be here. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but it wasn't. It was just that I I knew God wanted me to be here. Right. So it wasn't until about a year uh, later, my, uh, my our production manager at the time. His wife had a sister, and he said, and she said to me, because well, I would spend time with them and, and different things, and she said, would you take my sister on a date? Mm. And, and I was dating a few girls here in Pittsburgh, but it, it just, I knew that it wasn't the one, you know. So, and I said, well, yeah, sure. So I met, I met uh, her sister, Faye, and I was like, Wow. <laughs> and she was actually dating somebody at the time. It wasn't real super serious, but it was. And and I was just like, wow. You you know I I just it's There's like something special it's, there. it's like yeah. again you know God shows you these mental pictures from time to time, and you know I felt like God was showing me. It's, it's like I'm going to show you the right one. And I mean I went to a youth group. At St. Martin's, you know, and there was a lot of nice girls there and stuff. But I just never felt like, uh, where, what do you, what do you want? Where, where do you want me, mm-hmm. Lord? You know. And then when I met Faye, it was just like, wow, she's. I, I remember my sister getting mad at me for breaking up with girls when I was in Tulsa at ORU. I just was real picky, and I really, it just there was something that just wasn't right, you know. And when I met Faye, it was just like, wow. And so then I think she was a little bit unsure. She didn't want to move to Pittsburgh. But I was like, well, God, you have to tell her mm-hmm. to move to Pittsburgh because it's not going to be me. And uh, so 
Um, it was a period of about another year later. So really after I was here, maybe about two and a half years, that's when uh, Faye moved to Pittsburgh and then we got married in 1982. Mm. So I, I say to people, the only reason I, I have such a great wife is because I was faithful in what God asked me to do. Mm. And he put Faye in my life. Yeah. And it, it's kind of emotional, but um, she is uh, she's the greatest. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm blessed. And so all I, all I w- would kind of like say is that if God really tells you to do something, he will, he will take care of the rest for you. Yeah. And God Amen. has continued to work here. Like I, I did all these things, you know, I'm raising my kids and doing all this stuff. And then my dad died in 2000. And when, when he died, we were trying to, as a family, trying to figure out something besides just give flowers, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and he he had started this origin show that I kind of hated to direct. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was just kind of like, yeah, we're doing this show in 1985. But after my dad died, I really looked into what creation was all about. Yeah. You know, in, in the book of Job, God talks about What's the most important thing that he talks of Job about? He talks about his creation. Yeah. And it's just like God finally showed me why I was here. Hmm. You're you're here to continue the creation story, to put all that information that's out there. Right. For people I mean, you just don't hear about all this. You know, soft tissue found in dinosaur bones. Do you hear about that? No. I've heard about it because I I know of our origins. But I mean, but there's so many things like the rocks tell us so many different things. It's just a narrative that they put out there. So anyway, I was like, in 2004, I was like, this is what I'm, you know, I, I had been here for what? How many years? I'd been here since what? 1980. So, so I mean, really 24 years I was here. And I finally faithful. figured out, I finally figured out why I was really here, mm. and it was to continue doing the origins program. And of course, we stepped it up. We we retooled the show into a different show, and now we've retooled it like three different times now. Right. And, and it's the longest running. It's the longest continually running program. Yeah, that we have here yeah. at Cornerstone. Um, right, right, with the same name. Mm-hmm. But um, we, yeah, we, there's so much information that we have out there. Now for creation. Yeah. And it's just this narrative that the evolutionists put out there. It's so confusing now for evolutionists that they're coming up, you know, they had Darwinism, then they had Neo-Darwinism. Uh-huh. Now they have the third, what they call the third way of evolution. It's because that we have so much data, like the DNA does, you know, it, it shows us that we were, we've were we not been around millions of years. Mm-hmm. And it re- it literally shows that our DNA is going to fall apart. It's only a matter of time. I mean, we we are, you know, like they say that the the universe has has like wound up and it's slowly winding down and we're just dissipating. Is that um, the law of entropy? Well, you know, it, it sounds right, John. I I can't remember. I I have so much. I listen to so many of these creation guys yeah. talk, and but the idea is that the Earth is not becoming this great. We're not turning into this great master race. It's uh, um, basically creationists believe that you know primitive man was much smarter than than they give credit for. Mm-hmm. In fact, he was much more inventive and, and creative and imaginative than than we can even imagine. He just didn't have the he didn't he wasn't able to add on to the inventions on top of inventions right. like. Like like we are have today, you know, in in certain ways, but um, anyway, um, so I'm working on this special called the Miracle of Creation, and it, and I've had to start and stop it, but we started a fund back when my dad died. It's mm-hmm. called the Origins Fund, and people have given to the Origins Fund over the years, and they continue to, mm. and what whenever I have to put stock video related to what people are talking about or whatever that costs you know 50 100 150 dollars a pop right, right for a little few second clip yeah so this miracle of creation has been started and stopped basically because of 
financial situations here and, and, and certain uh, mm -hmm. responsibilities have been laid on me mm -hmm. um, as we've had a change in management in the last few years. But I'm on the board now, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they they felt like a, a Bixler needed to be on the board, and so that I represent the Bixler family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel called, and now people are are supporting Origins. They, they support Cornerstone, but I, and I always tell them if you want to support Origins, that's fine, but you you can't you can't stop your regular support for Cornerstone. Right, right. And so I'm working on this special, and I've really I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on this special mm. uh, with all the things related to it. And I was kind of at a point where God, you you have to you have to bring the money in. And I was like, well, maybe Fan and I are going to have to pay for it. I even told my wife, and she's always been like, if that's what we got to do, we got to do it, you yeah. know. But the Lord just has come through with some big funding recently, and that's it just awesome. it was just kind of like a great confirmation that I can trust Him, believe mm -hmm. Him, and again, it's kind of the Lord gave me a a, a vision of something that birth in my heart something yeah. in 2018 that's actually going to actually air in 2021 so that's so cool so you know again i don't know if it takes like two to three years or in my parents case it took nine and a half ten mm -hmm. years before we got the station on the air but i know that if god really births something in your heart and you're faithful and some people say that god tests you i just think the devil just does not want you to do it yeah and he does everything to stop you yeah, and in so my true. case, I was, I was like, why did I even come to Pittsburgh? Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't even know my my true purpose until I was been here for twenty four years. That's amazing, and you were you faithful know? throughout that whole time. Well, yeah, but I mean, I did all kinds of things. I learned right, how to right. do all kinds of production type things, and you know, I just really believe that I'm I'm really blessed to be able to work in an organization where I have the freedom mm -hmm. and the actually the financial backing now. To do the things that that I want, I want to do, and uh, you know, I can't compete with something on PBS. There's these specials, you know, and they start off, and they're, they're beautiful cinematography and and uh, animations and all this stuff, and it's fine until they get to the point where they they say 122 million years ago or 140. It just it's it it you know, my dad. I remember used to get mad, and I used to kind of get mad, and now I just laugh. Mm. I mean, it's just laughable that the creator of the universe, you know, here's that's who we're talking about here, it, that he could not do the these things, and it's not. And they're claiming that he could. Yeah, do these yeah. Things, I yeah. mean, the oil and the coal and the and the diamonds. They, they've done all these tests, and there's this. Uh, it, it's it's a long winded story, mm -hmm. but you know, you talk about carbon fourteen. These creationists have been testing diamonds. Uh, and they're finding carbon-14 in diamonds are supposed to be billions of years old, and the half-life of carbon-14 is much less. And, mm -hmm. But th there's so much information. So this Miracle of Creation special, and I'm going to use some of the segments in regular origin shows, oh, cool. has a lot of just easy to fairly easy to understand information that it's, it just is out there yeah. that people just aren't aware of. Yeah. You know, and and the bottom line is what we want to do is we want to we want to basically show how science proves creation. And it really does, and it's so easy because now the creationists and the evolution have evolutionists have all the same data. Mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of whose narrative are you going to believe? Right. You know, there's so much compelling evidence for for somebody to believe that soft tissue and dinosaur. Is 85 million years old. But it's still soft. It's still soft and pliable. I mean, yeah. we show in the special how you've got this I can't soft, wait to see pliable. That. So it's just, it's almost laughable, but but and it's but it's sad at the same time mm -hmm. because they're they're convinced of their 85 million years old in uniformitarianism, which means everything what we see today is the key to the past. Or just eons of time that it's mm -hmm. taken, you know, basically creationists believe that the continents split apart. That whole thing happened during Noah's flood, you know, the worldwide mm -hmm. flood like 4,500 years ago. And, and now they're finding all these things. These uh, Mount St. Helens went off and they're finding things like coal beds. Yeah. This is from the 1980s we're talking here. Wow. So, I mean, the pressures and the things that went on during during the flood and so, like mm -hmm. I said, I did a special on the Ark 
uh, oh, yeah. encounter, yeah. and we I did a segment there where I wanted to hire an animator to do it, but I ended up he he bailed on me, so I ended up having to do the limited amount of special effects that I could mm-hmm. do, you know, to kind yeah. of tell the creation story, versus you know the creationist right. version of of Noah's uh, flood, the worldwide flood, like yeah. forty five hundred years ago. That's so cool that you're doing that, Paul, and that that's that you know even though it took you twenty four years before you knew like. This is the big reason that God's brought me here. Yeah. This is so cool. Yeah. And it was something that your dad was passionate about. And he's been able to be carried on well after his his passing. Um, you know, Paul, we we're talking about looking back at, at history and, and looking back at these dates. You know, as you look back at your life, when you see, when you think about your life, where do you now see Jesus walking with you that you didn't see at the moment? Well, that's kind of a tough thing. I, I, I just the, the the thing getting back to like creation and yeah. origins is, can we really believe the Book of Genesis? Mm-hmm. You know, can we really believe it? And and that's the that's the point at where we we are right now. And for me, I I just kind of believe that if God wants to enter into history and do something. He's going to do it. He'll mm-hmm. do what he's going to do. And But I don't understand why certain things have to happen certain ways. Mm-hmm. But it's like if he says he's going to do something, you know he's going to do it. Mm-hmm. And I and I don't even know if, if you talk about Jesus, I don't even know if Jesus knew that the earth was going to last another 2,000 whatever years. You know, at that point, in his human Mm. Uh, thinking, yeah, you know, I know that maybe wrestled with somebody's some people's theology, but but I'm I'm just wondering if he really if he really grasped that we're talking two thousand years, yeah, you know, we know Jesus is coming back again, yeah. but just every every generation probably thought it can't get any worse than this. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what can you imagine what it would have been like during World War II? I mean, all these people and all this uh, Adolf Hitler and yeah. all the crazy things that were going on in the planet mm-hmm. and then, um but uh anyway yeah. i don't know if i answered your question but as you look at your your own story though yeah. where do you see where do you realize that jesus was walking with you you mentioned a few different places along your path already that uh you know that, that god has led you yeah i mean i i just feel like i think i've inherited a little bit of sensitivity from my mother mm. and i i feel like if I, if if you're willing to really willing to sit sit down and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to your heart, that He does. Mm. And wh- when I write these articles for the newsletter called By His Spirit, mm. whenever I write one, I, I I tell the girls that that want me to do those. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, I I I need to hear from the Lord when I write one of those, mm-hmm. and I just I just. I guess I've learned that God's always faithful to show me the, give me direction on what I'm supposed to do. Mm. Um, and uh, my kids have taught me I've le- I need to learn how to do unconditional love. <laughs> and um, my wife has taught me that. And I think that's what God has for us, unconditional love. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but <laughs> in a way, in a way, that's that's good. My, yeah. my the question I like to ask with that goes along with that one though is if you could go back in time and visit young Paul somewhere in your own timeline, what advice would you give yourself, and what what age would that be? Kind of like what's going on in your life? What would you say? Well, I wish I had spent more time when I was in college learning. Learning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I. I was I spent so much time at the TV station, and I I enjoyed the, being around a lot of Christian kids, and uh, mm-hmm. I enjoyed the camaraderie and the, just the fun times that we had. And, and uh, I would have probably buckled down and studied better, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, there were points in time where I did, but it was just um, I always always was ready for the next step, and mm-hmm. I was. Enjoy the moments that you're at in life. Like if you're in college, enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Take the time to learn. God's going to take care of you. You know, I was always like, how am I going to pay for this? How am Mm -hmm. I going to, you know, I didn't have 
I mean, some kids would come to college and their parents would pay for everything. And I wasn't, it wasn't that way for me, mm -hmm. you know. So I was always worried about how am I going to pay for this? What job am I going to get? When I, you know, whereas in hindsight, God was always going to be faithful. Right. It's just a matter of uh, trusting and just enjoy the periods of time that you're at. So now I have grandkids. Mm -hmm. And there are times where I, you know, I want to deal that, do this, and, you know, like my dad, I felt like there were times where my dad wanted to like save the world or go, to, you know, and he didn't have time for his family at, at some mm. points. And I think he would probably say the same thing. Not that we we knew he loved us and everything, mm -hmm. but he mm -hmm. just knew he was a busy man. And I don't ever want my kids to feel like, and my grandkids to feel like I don't have time for mm. you. I, I, you know. I have important things to do, but I have time for you. That's you know, good. That's, and, and I think every station in life that you're at, you need to take time and appreciate where you are, where you are experience what you are, and enjoy the process of getting to the next thing instead of always thinking ahead to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Enjoy where you are and know and trust that God has, your, has you where he wants you, and he's going to let you know if you need to, you know, change or go somewhere else or do something else. But I'm probably maybe a little impatient, you know, uh, and <laughs> I think I've we learned, all are. And like I say, it took me 24 years before. I mean, you think how long were some of the characters in the Bible? I mean, how long did Moses go out there after he, There's you know, 40 years in the yeah, wilderness I mean, before I mean, he came back and right. led everybody else in the wilderness for another 40 years? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, uh, Took me 24 years to figure out why I was really here. Yeah, you know, and so I've had to challenge, you know, people that were running the operation here. I had to challenge them. They said, "Was that all you want to do? Is just like this origins creation stuff? Mm. Like, don't you want to do like these great TV stuff?" And I was like, they didn't ever understand why I was so centered on that. It was so easy for me to, and I explained it to them and. You know, so I remember Ron Hembry when I would tell him how I want to do this, and because yeah. it was under his administration, he kind of pushed me into doing the show. And then I realized once I really got into it, like this is really my calling. Mm -hmm. And then I remember Ron was just so excited for me, like he he appreciated Paul. Paul, Paul found his calling, yeah. and I want to help so him cool. with this. And then you know, other administrations like. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've had to, I've had to convince, mm -hmm. you know, that this is important and this is what we, we're doing. And I, I just, I don't understand how it's going to go on because I'm a sixty, I'm over sixty now. So mm -hmm. how is, how is this going to happen? But I, I just have to trust the Lord yeah. and know He's going to take care of this. So, yeah. and God is faithful, and yeah. He will see the things that He has spoken. He will see them come to completion. And we saw that with how God spoke to your mom. And, That's right. and then eventually to your dad as well about this TV station, which took then about 10 years of prayer and interceding and raising the funds before we actually saw it come to life. Yeah. And on uh, April yeah. 15th, 1979. Yeah. And so, I mean, it wasn't even, I mean, it, it's, it's like I say, it wasn't all this happy times, you yeah. know? I mean, it was just, it wasn't really till 1976 that it started to take off. Right. You know, here we are, my parents run around for like five years, and basically I, I think my dad had serious doubts sure, whether it could really happen, Yeah. you know. And and then here's his son, you know, coming home from college, working at a TV station saying, Dad, this is like crazy. You want to mm -hmm. do this in this little 20 by 40 building, you know, and, and look at what God's got today, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing, yeah. you know. And, uh you know, I've been I've been here for the for almost nine years, and uh, it has been a privilege and an honor to be part of the Cornerstone family and to have that as part of my DNA uh, when it comes to ministry and media, and just to know that God has used this time uh, tremendously for me. And I thank you so much for the legacy that you've been a part of laying here in the groundwork of, of Cornerstone, and just just the impact that this has made in my life and the origins program how that has made an impact and i remember watching that with my dad growing up and uh -huh. um, just knowing that creation that god really did in the beginning god really did create yeah that's right yeah and, and it's i think that's the compelling thing we need to do is that 
the, the, the science that's out there proves Genesis is a true, mm -hmm. true book. It's interesting they're finding water on the moon and finding water on Mars, mm -hmm. supposedly. That's what we've heard. And God says in the beginning he created with the waters, Yeah, you know, in, in the book of Genesis. I mean, it's just... It's so easy to see it when you're when you're when you've got that worldview. Like I remember, right. Dad used to talk about worldview. What's worldview? <laughs> you know, finally I understand. You know, yeah. it's just a whole worldview. And uh, I think a lot of people you can show all the the data that you want, and they're not going to believe. And I think part of that is God only reveals mm -hmm. to the people that have an open heart to, to receive. Yeah. Like if somebody is really, uh, actually, I know a lot of these scientists that have come to actually come to the Lord through the, the information that they've learned about how creation is true. Yeah. And they, and, and, and they used to be evolutionists because that's what you're taught. Right. You want a PhD or whatever you get a, you, you know, and then you start doubting, you will be a Darwin doubter. And then, then they start to, well, you can't teach here anymore. You mm -hmm. can't. You can't work here anymore. You know these guys. They go through all this these horrible things because. But it, there's some people that are not afraid. That they just deal with whatever they have to deal with, because they know for a fact that what they're what they're saying, evolution does not work, and that's why they're on the third way now, mm. because they know that there's just too much information we have. Yeah. Related to DNA and, and all those things. Uh, it just, uh, I mean, the the creative power that God's used throughout the world, what we see, the extreme detail. Yeah. And it's just, for somebody to believe that it just, just happened, you know, it's just, to me, that's almost... It's inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Even if I, if I was just an open-minded person, and that's the way my dad accepted the Lord. Mm -hmm. He was looking for the truth. He was not a Christian, and neither was my mother. Mm -hmm. You know, they came to the Lord just by because they were seeking. Yeah. You know, my dad was seeking, and then my mother was like, couldn't believe my dad was going to be a minister, mm -hmm. and then she wasn't even a Christian. You know, and then she came to the Lord, and you know, and then she ends up pushing my dad into the TV thing. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I, I love uh, how, I love how God works and he takes us on this journey with him. If we're going to, if we're willing to follow him and let him lead us along the way, it's a great journey for sure. And, you know, as, as, as you're listening to this and you're interested in what Paul is talking about, the origins program, I'm going to make sure to put a link in the show notes so that you can check out some episodes of this origins program. It is phenomenal. And sometimes you have to rewatch certain parts because these guys that, that Paul brings on the show are phenomenal teachers. But the stuff that they talk about, sometimes you just it takes a little bit of time for us to get caught up on that. But they do a great job. Well, explaining well, it, so. So, some are more technical than others. Right, right. So I, yeah. I try to have some technical people and then I have some people that are more apologetics mm -hmm. and they talk about um, and we always want to do more. And I've wanted to do more, but I'm just like one yeah. person, you know, right. So, you so know. I'm, I'm going to make sure to put the <laughs> origins in the show notes so people can watch that, Paul. And I just want to thank you for allowing me to join you along your way. There were some times during that interview that I was definitely getting emotional thinking about my move that was coming up in just a few days and how I was leaving this history and this legacy behind. But it's still part of me. It's still part of who I am, and it's still part of who God made me to be. Our experiences in our life, no matter how far away they are, they make us who we are. And my almost 10 years of being with Cornerstone, counting my time volunteering, really shaped me to be somebody that really wants to broadcast the gospel. And now I'm getting to do that in a different way, but I'm still doing similar things. The story of faith that Paul shared about his parents and how they started Cornerstone Television and having that verse about lifting high his signal really has made an impact. His dad, Russ Bixler, actually wrote the story of how Cornerstone Television came to be in a book called Faith Works, which I read while I was still in YWAM. It is very interesting how God used that story to prepare me 
for being a part of Cornerstone Television Network and how the things that I learned there have prepared me for what I'm doing now. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Paul Bixler as much as I enjoyed having it and listening to it again. I'll be providing a link so that you can watch the show that Paul produces called Origins. And you can also check out Cornerstone Television Network. I want to thank you for listening to Along the Way. If you've enjoyed joining me along my way, please share this with a friend who you think will be encouraged by this podcast. Also, please rate and review Along the Way on iTunes. That helps more people discover Along the Way. And subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and at my website, alongtheway.media. If you want to support me in this podcast, I have a Patreon page. The link to become a supporter is also in my show notes. I hope that you've enjoyed this part of my journey, and may you realize when Jesus is walking with you along your way. Along the Way is honored to be part of the Charisma Podcast Network. You can find tons of spirit-filled content from their vast catalog of podcasts, including my Monday through Friday news stories for the Charisma News Podcast. Go to cpnshows.com to see the full list and latest episodes.